The book of Leviticus, Levit uh, this is a part four, so if you have, are here and you missed the previous part, maybe it's good to go to the YouTube channel and uh, you can catch up with the messages that we have brought. By the way, our, light, our Lighthouse YouTube channel is reaching near to 70,000 hits, which is really encouraging, I think. It's really going, growing fast, so it means that many people are uh, constantly uh, going and uh, feeding themselves, listening, sharing with their family and friends. Hallelujah. So w today, we are uh, having the, the title, Call to Serve. So we are going to apply some of the principles that we learn through the priesthood of the book of Leviticus, spe more specifically the ordinations of the priest. That is when they became to officially uh, practice, exercise their, their calling in the Lord. And we are going to talk about our calling, draw some lessons from this uh, study. Uh, we are, we have to bring two important essential principle before we move on to the subject today to understand the lessons that we can receive from the symbolism of, of this book. The number one lesson, we, we've talked about it a bit but I want to make it very like important to us this morning. When you look at the priesthood of the Old Testament, this was uh, a shadow, we, uh, we have studied that, a shadow, a, a prefiguration, a type of something that was going to come. It's like God was educating us for the day when the Messiah, the Anointed One, Jesus Christ, would come and be the perfect sacrifice, give His life, and He would become also the High Priest of our salvation. So, to interpret this book this morning for us modern Christian living under grace in the New Testament, we need to make it very, very clear that Jesus Christ has fulfilled perfectly once and for all all that the Leviticus priesthood was unable to do. That is very important for us. When we look to the priesthood, we must understand that Jesus has done it all. It is, our salvation is secure. And we have some scriptures to just go quickly over these, these scriptures. Next slide. Hebrews chapter 10. For it is impossible for the blood of the bulls and the goats to take away sins. We've, we've discussed that, that point before. So even though the Leviticus priesthood was, was established, to allow sinful people to approach the Holy God through a series of very severe regulations and very detailed requirements to, to, uh, to do everything perfectly as God commanded in order to be atoned for, atonement means to cover, their sin would be covered, so that they could come into the presence of the Holy God. Even though this God has established the system, as I said, it was like a prefiguration of the perfect time and history of the perfect sacrifice that Jesus would. So, so the blood of the bulls and the goats that we read about in the book of Leviticus has not been perfect. So this priesthood system has been abolished and changed for the new covenant that Jesus Christ came to, uh, to establish with us. So it's been removed, this system has been removed. Now Jesus is the sacrifice, He is the high priest, He is the mediator, the only mediator between you and God. So that is very clear in the, in the scriptures. And, and let me say something while, while I'm on that, that point here. In, in the Bible, in the New Testament, because Jesus now is our high priest, perfect high priest, and everything has been dealt with concerning our salvation. We have to uh, have a certain warning for this morning. Nowhere in the New Testament from Matthew to Revelation, the name priest has been given to any earthly ministry in virtue of his office. There is no such a title or word in the Greek language and the New Testament that says these people ought to be priests. Because this priesthood has been abolished. To offer sacrifice for sin has been completely perfected in Jesus Christ once and for all. And he has 
sanctified, make perfect for all times those who are being sanctified. Since we have already a great high priest who entered heaven with his own blood and he meditates for us, he is an interceded, you don't need this imperfect system when you have the perfect system. Do we, do we all uh, understand that this morning? This is very clear. So in the New Testament, there is no a single time, single mention of the word sacerdotos to describe a, a ministry over church uh, spiritual leadership. In the New Testament, the terms that we find are presbyteros. Presbyteros, that means you find it in uh, 1 Timothy chapter 3, you find it in Titus. Presbyteros means elders, which refers to maturity, someone who has grown in the Lord and is able to give some type of leadership guidance to the church. Presbyteros, groups of elders. That's the term we have. The other term is episkopos, that is sometimes translated as bishop, but bishop is also a term, a terminology in modern English that has been twisted by history. But bishop means not a bishop in the Catholic Church or Episcopalian Church, it means an overseer. It, that's what the word means. Episcopos means overseer. Someone that has spiritual insight, that the Holy Spirit is filling, that God has called for a special function, that has an oversight to lead the church and missions and prayers, to know God, to equip the saints for the work of ministry. These are the two terms that you find when you talk about spiritual leadership and church government in the New Testament. Not a single time you find the word sacerdotos, okay? You find another term that is diakonos, diakonos or the deacons, but actually the word diakonos means simply servant. Uh, serving at the table. Somebody who served even Jesus Christ and his role as the servant who gave his life as a ransom for us is also being called as a diaconos. So diaconos is another word that, that we find. So these are the, the basic words. And other words that you will find if you want to go a little bit further, you have apostolos. The one who were sent by the Lord, called and sent to proclaim, the proclaimers. So these are the, the terminology that you have in the New Testament. But not a single time you have sacerdotos, because this system, no more. You don't need it. Jesus has done it all. So if you find it in the church today, it means that they have twisted the theology wrongly. That's what it means, basically. Okay? Are we clear on that? All right, praise the Lord. So let, uh, let, point number two, it is clear in the New Testament that this is them to have physical priests that offer sacrifice for sin today in the blood and everything. This is over. But there's something that is new that concerns you and me. We are being called priests. Whoa, now you will say, you, 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 Pastor, you are confusing me. There is no more, but now you see there is. Y yeah, okay. But this one, we will, by the end of the sermon, you will understand more clearly. You will not be as confused. This physical system of priesthood does not exist. But there is, by association with our high priest, a, a calling, like a role, something that we do, that we will find in the analogies of the priesthood of the Old Testament lessons for the role that God has called to us to fulfill in our generation today. Is that a bit said a bit better? Yes? You understand that? Just, uh, just a very few of you understand. <laughs> we will continue. Chapter 8. The ordination of uh, Aaron. We will go into many details and scriptures to, to, to do a run through and throughout all of, all of this we will find analogies that will apply to us as being the priests of the New Testament. These analogies will help us to understand our new identity and our calling in the New Testament. So if you read this text here, bring Aaron and his sons along with their sacred garment, anointing oil, bull, sin offering, two rams, a basket of bread without yeast, and call the entire community of Israel together in the entrance of the tabernacle. This was a historical moment. Never happened before at that time. Very special moment. These priests that 
Moses had received a revelation about, uh, that they have described their, their, their clothing, their holy garments that the, the priest was. And by the way, the holy garments of the priest and the Old Testament is also filled with symbolism about the salvation in Christ, about the, the priesthood of Jesus Christ, everything. If you were in Lighthouse many years ago, uh, Sister Mary, uh, Pastor Jennifer's mom, has done a wonderful detailed uh, study of all of this. And Pastor Jennifer also did that years ago, but not this morning. I'm just seeing it in, pass in passing. So each part, each covering has a definite spiritual symbolism relating to the priesthood of Jesus Christ. So here we see that Moses is calling the priest to come, the congregation to come, and this is going to be the ordination of the priest. And in the last three messages, we talked in details about the seven offerings that were necessary uh, regulations, requirement to bring a whole uh, unholy person to be atoned for so that they could come into the presence of God. But here, for the priest, each sacrifice, the five sacrifices will be practiced for the priest. Uh, Moses is the one performing uh, the sacrifice. And we want to, uh, Exodus chapter 29 is a chapter that state in advance and with details what all the details and why are they. If you look at this text here, God is speaking in advance. He's, this is today is the fulfillment of what has been said maybe a few months before that. God said, I will meet the people of Israel there in the place made holy by my glorious presence. Yes, I will consecrate the tabernacle, the altar, and I will consecrate Aaron and his sons to serve me as priest. Then I will live among the people of Israel and be their God, and they will know that I am the Lord their God. So this is the purpose that God had to establish the priesthood. They will know me, but I am going to make them holy, consecrate them, and the different Bible version has different terms, make them holy, I will consecrate them, I will sanctify them. The word is Kadesh, and the word Kadesh means exactly that, uh, bring to a state of innocence, blameless, pure, acceptable, so that they can function as priests, to serve me as priests, so that God can come and live and dwell in our midst. Isn't it why the church exists today? That the presence of God come? So these principles that we find in the Old Testament are very uh, important for us today because we find the, the foundation of it in our relation with God today. Has God changed from this time to today? Is He still holy? Yes. Is there still sin in this world? Are we, is it possible that you and I can be defiled by different things of the world? Yes. yes. So we need to apply certain principle, but today we find that in Jesus Christ. We don't have to shed the blood. Uh, you remember I, in the first uh, sermon on that series, I was mentioning the example. Imagine if one of you would be Imagine yourself doing the sacrifices, bringing, cutting, the, slitting the throat of the, the lamb, uh, picking up the blood and everything. Many of you would faint by doing that. So we don't need to do it. Jesus Christ has done that. He has fulfilled that. Okay, let's go to the next uh, picture that we find from verse 6 to 13. And you will see a series of uh, uh, process of preparation for the congregation. First thing you will see is wash them with water. This is a process. We start by cleaning. The cleaning work for you and for me is done in Jesus Christ, as I said many times, and we will repeat it. But it is appropriated by faith. You, you, you understand? Jesus has shed his blood for us to forgive our sin. But if you don't accept it, if you don't believe it, if you don't receive it, he has done it, but you have not yet appropriated it. So our washing is done by the blood of Jesus, by faith. We appropriate it. Number two, there is a, a continual washing for all Christians today. Uh, because we are called to renew our mind. Uh, the word of God is spoken in the New Testament as one who wash 
us continually. Uh, the w regeneration of the Holy Spirit is something we find in the New Testament, which indicate to us that there is a need for you and I to continually be washed as we live and desire the presence of God in the church, as desire the presence of God in our heart, in our life, in our home. There is a need for you and I to be washed continually on a daily basis. We can do it in prayer, we can do it in reading the word and our personal devotion and letting the Holy Spirit filling us and refilling us. There is a need for uh, this what kind of what we call sanctification. Then you find a mention that he put on Aaron and later on on his son, he repeats. He starts with Aaron because he's the high priest. Then he will repeat a similar with the, the same details to the sons. He put to them the holy garment. So all of these, as I says, have a, a symbolism that uh, relate to Jesus Christ. And we, when we believe in Jesus and Revelation, you find that we have been clothed with the righteousness of Jesus Christ. So we also wear new garment, holy garment in a way. We have that. In the book of Ephesians, it, we are exhorted to remove the old garment and to put on the new garment. See, there is a lot of similarities in the vocabulary used by the writer of the New Testament that go back to this book. The, the picture that he used, you know sometimes we just read it and take for granted, remove the garment, put on the garment. But this picture, why do they use this, these illustrations? Because this illustration comes from what they knew. You, you, you know, you understand that the apostles of Jesus Christ were living under the Old Testament principle until they were baptized of the Holy Spirit. But their, their knowledge, their training, their vocabulary, their understanding of God's Word was the Old Testament. That's why there are so many quotes. They always quote the Old Testament and then they illustrate it, they, they explain the theology of it for us today. But their language comes from the Old Testament, so we, we find a lot of these things. And then he says that these clothes, in verse 12, he poured some of the anointing oil on Aaron's head, anointing him and making him holy for his work. Again, you find the same principle, making him holy for his work, or consecrated, ready to, acceptable, in a, in a state where God can accept him, where he can begin his, his, his work. And Aaron is the forerunner of Jesus Christ. And it talks about the Christ, the anointed one. You know, when Jesus began his ministry, in Luke chapter 4, he quotes Isaiah 6, 61, and he says, The Spirit of the Lord has anointed me. So already he, he claimed that he is the Messiah, the Christ, the anointed one, and that God now is going to release him to bring the good news to the poor, deliver the captives, set them free, and all of this. He used this illustration in Luke chapter 24 to you. It says, after the resurrection of Jesus Christ, don't go just serving God, rushing away. Wait in the city until you will be clothed with power of the Holy Spirit that my Father will send. Again, this same illustration, holy garment, anointed with oil, you will be anointed, endued or clothed with the Holy Spirit, the presence of God on you. It's necessary for them, symbolically for us, it is necessary that there is a clothing, a covering, a fullness of the Holy Spirit. Then in verse 13 it says, Moses repeat this same kind of process for Aaron's son. Now let's go to verse uh, 14 to verse uh, 31. <coughs> Sorry. Verse uh, 14 to 31 you will see that the list where the five essential S offerings that we mentioned in chapter 1 to chapter 7 are all being practiced for Aaron, for his son. Moses is the one performing. Verse 6, you see there the, uh, no I'm sorry, here, 14. Presented the bull, the sin offering, the burnt offering, the other ram for the, the ordination, the consecration. Then you see the bread offering. Then you see 
the peace offering. All of the sacrifice comes in sequence for all of them. It is necessary that the priest also uh, go through the same process of the sacrifice that God instituted to prepare someone to be holy for service. And we find, we find that is very, very, very important. He make and pronounce them clean, holy, and he, he prepare them. And it's very clear that this is a preparation for work that they are going to do. If you look at verse, <coughs> next slide, we will find what some, some specification that is happening. When they kill the second ram, the ram of dedication or consecration or ordination, something special uh, took place at this moment. Moses took the, the blood, applied it to the red lobe of their ear, the right side, the right thumb, and the right toenail. They had blood put on each one of them. And this was very, very important that it was done in this way. Why? Because now being priests, they were the one and that applies to you also, because if we are priests today in the New Testament, you, we have a privilege and also a duty to hear the word of the Lord. You need to hear the, the word of the Lord. If you hear the word of the Lord, you can transmit it. You, you can understand the will of the Lord. You feel His closeness. You hear His voice. You do His will. The hands is a symbol of the work, or the work of our hands. So it's under the blood, it's been cleansed, it's been made ready to work for God. It's pure, holy hands unto the Lord. So you can serve. You are there as a priest to walk, uh, to work for the Lord and to serve, do His will. And then with your feet, then you walk and you walk in His ways. You live your life. You do His will. You go on mission. You go to work. You, you live your, your daily life. So you find these things that are very significant. And then uh, the anointing oil and the blood. And verse 33 will tell us something that is very important. It is toward the end of the chapter. You must not leave the tabernacle for seven days. This was the durations of their ordination ceremony. Everything we have done today was commanded by the Lord. And by the way, this expression comes almost in every section of every sacrifice as they have done as commanded by the Lord to Moses. They have done as commanded by Moses to the Lord. All along they went down. So they were commanded by the Lord in order to purify you and making you right with God. Because you cannot serve God if these two things have not been taking place and established in, in your heart anymore. You cannot, you cannot do that. Then if you go to chapter 9, chapter 9 you see the priests who begin their ministry. Let me summarize the verses just that comes before that. After the ordination ceremony on the eighth day, they have another gathering, the people come. And now realize that for the very first time, the priests themselves are going to perform these five sacrifices. Until now, they have not done it themselves. Until now, it has been explained why to do it. Then Moses has done it in chapter 8 to them to prepare them and purify them. But now that the, the, their, their consecration, their dedication ceremony, seven days, is complete, now they begin to serve as priests. They are now in function. First thing they will do, they will have to perform all of these sacrifices for the very first time. But the very interesting thing is that they do it for themselves first and they will do it for the people uh, after that. And, and verse 4 says, Present all of these offerings to the Lord because the Lord will appear to you today. This is a this very special moment. If you remember when the book of Exodus finished, the tabernacle was built, 
the glory of God came in the tabernacle, the presence of Almighty God was glorious, but they could not go in. So now the sacrifice are explained, the sacrifice are being practiced. This day, God is going to move in. God is going to let them have access to, to Him. This is going to change everything on that day. So he says, present all these offerings to the Lord because the Lord will appear to you today. So the people presented all of these things. And these instructions, Moses instructed the priest, bring these sorts of animals for these sorts of sacrifice, prepare it. This will be used for your own purification. And then tell the people that they need to bring their own sacrifice for their own preparation and their own purification. So you have two things going on at once. Because before the priest will be allowed to minister to you or to, to them, he has to be holy, clean, purified. So he has to always. This is why the, the priesthood of the Old Testament is not perfect. Because they had to do it every day. They had to do it all the time. They had the consciousness and the memory of their sinfulness all the time. And even the priests were the highest and the one called to be closest to God had to offer continually, day by day, sacrifice for their own sin. That shows the holiness of God is not to take for granted. That shows that it is a serious thing to approach the Lord. They had to do it every single time when they were going to offer sacrifice for, for the people. They had to offer sacrifice for themselves all the time. Imagine the blood uh, and everything that was taking place uh, all, all the time. So this is what is happening there. So the people presented all of these things at the entrance. Verse 6, this is what the Lord has commanded you to do so that the glory of God may appear to you. How many of you here would like the glory of God to appear to you? Amen. This, is, this is the point. That's why we are, we are Christian. We want the glory of God. We want the presence of God, the blessing, access to God, the fullness. We want the full package. That, that's, that comes with accepting Jesus. But we find, in order to have that, a series of analogies or principles that are still valid for us today. You want the fullness? Well, do you live? Do you, do, do you live so that you have it? Are you really in Jesus Christ? Do you abide in Him? Are you, are you pure? Do you live really in the light? Well, how is your life like? You know, like, uh, are you fit to come into the presence of God? Can God appear to you uh, in the state that you are now? So there's something to, to, to think about uh, over that. In uh, verse 7, we see again the, the principle. First, sacrifice your sin offering for yourself. He's talking to the priest. And then, present the offerings of the people to purify them as the Lord commanded. Now, let's go to uh, the next slide. Uh, yeah, okay, this one. This wonderful text here is the result of the ordination. And that's, that's glorious. Moses and Aaron Moses and Aaron went into the tabernacle and when they came back out they blessed the people again and the glory of the Lord appeared to the old community fire blazed forth from the Lord's presence and consumed the burnt offering and the fat on the altar when the people saw this they shouted with joy and fell face down on the ground because today for the first time God is showing us his favor he is with us. He's showing us His, his glory. Uh, this, is, this is absolutely uh, wonderful what, what we have over here. Is that right? Yes. Great. Let's look at the next slide now. What happened? Verse 4 is the last verse that we just read. And I want to contrast something. Look at how chapter 9 finished. Glorious day. First day in this story. Fire blaze from the Lord. Consumed by the burn, burn offering, the people saw this, they shout with joy, the fire of God come down. Now the next chapter can begin, chapter 10. We, I don't know how many days or the next day or whatever. The son of Aaron, who are now priests, go in and they do their function. Aaron's sons, Nadab and Abu, they take a censer, place coal in it, fire. They put incense unto the Lord's presence with 
unauthorized fire. They have done something that had not been prescribed by the Lord. What happened? So a fire came out from the Lord's presence, incinerated them, and they died. Wow. The first day, they were fellowshipping, they were eating, they were shouting, they were rejoicing. They have God's presence, God loves us, we are with God, and everything is perfect. This is, this is like uh, wonderful. The next day, or whenever it, this happened, another fire. One fire, another fire. One fire brings life and joy and fullness, another fire brings judgment. What happened? It's the fire, it's God. But one is for positive, one is for the negative. So fire came out. And then God says, by those who come near me, and this is a universal principle that has no time, those who come near me, or those who come to serve me, I must be regarded as holy, and before all the people, I must be glorified. And this talks to us today about consecrating our professional activity or daily activity. There's some Bible uh, scholar that use this text and look at this and they see our professional activity. You go, you live your life. You are serving God. You go into the world. You live as a representative of God. And we need to re regard the things of God as holy because if we want God to bless our lives and we want to be used by God, this is a calling. We are called to a higher uh, function by God. The glory of God appeared to all the people. There was joy, they bowed down in reverence. Then we find Nadab and Abihu, and we find another thing that is happening, and now it is judgment. What happened there? Wh why is that? We don't know exactly what this idea of strange fire was about. There's a lot of theories on that. But something went wrong. They did something. They did, they did maybe were careless. They were supposed to do everything according to what God instructed them. But some, maybe their attitude. There's a verse later in that text that may suggest that they may have been drunk and may have approached the holy God having uh, drank alcohol because there's a strong exhortation in another verse just next after that that says, uh, don't drink alcoholic or strong alcohol when you come into the temple to serve the Lord. So some people associate that act with their attitude. But there's something, a warning here that we need to take heed over that. But we live under grace. And we know that this kind of things is not happening to us. But the principle, that's what I want to think. This is an analogy. God, this was the beginning of something. God was setting the perfect system, his standards, and breaking the standards of God meant judgment. Do you, do you remember in the book of Acts, chapter 5? It was also at the beginning of something new that God established, the new covenant after Pentecost, Ananias and Sapphira. Both of them were judged. These, many people compare these two events for the same principle. Carelessness, God established his system brand new. This is how we are going to obey. This is how we are going to live. This is how we are going to function. And carelessness or lying or with deceptions or with I don't care. I'll do it my way. Then we go in and God says, no, I'm building something here, pure holy and it's going to affect everybody if i let you mess up everything and lower the standards i'm destroying the whole work so i need to maintain that so at the beginning of the work here there's a judgment at the beginning of the church there is a judgment also but we know that we are under grace we are we are under jesus christ so there is forgiveness there is purity but there is a warning about carelessness or something when I look at this text here and compare these two fires, one word came to my mind this morning. It's the word disi discipleship. It's the word discipleship. I want to serve Jesus. I want to follow Jesus. I, I consider myself as a follower of Jesus Christ. So discipleship is a big, big word, isn't it? 
is someone who follows the master, who obeys the master, who serves the master regardless of anything else. So we must have certain uh, standards. Amen? Amen? So look at the next uh, slide. Hebrew chapter 10, 19 to 22 is talking to us in our new role here in Christ Jesus. Therefore, brothers and sisters, since we have confidence to enter the most holy place by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way open for us through the curtain, that is his body, and since we have a great high priest over the house of God. So this is repeating and establishing everything that we have seen, Jesus fulfilling all that the Leviticus system could not fulfill. He has done that. So now we can enter in the most holy place. Now we can go behind the curtain that was reserved once a year to the only the high priest. Now we can do that. You have the access the deepest part of God's heart nowadays. You can go through the curtain and you can draw near to God. Let us draw near to God. And look at the, the vocabulary used here. Sincere heart or pure heart. Uh, having our hearts sprinkled. You know the sprinkling, we see that in Leviticus. Sprinkling of water, sprinkling of oil, sprinkling of blood. Our hearts are being sprinkled to cleanse us from a guilty conscience. And having our bodies washed with pure water. We find the same symbolism from Leviticus, but in the New Testament, inviting us to come with full assurance to come to God. But if we, we, we look at this text and we reflect upon Leviticus, we see, yes, I can go to Jesus Christ, but I must also not take for granted, be serious how I approach God. And one of the things that I have been thinking, looking at Leviticus, is like, what happened to our modern Christianity where the fear of the Lord, the seriousness, the consecration, uh, has been so much kind of discard, discarded or, or looked at a bit on the lighter side and not so important. I don't know exactly how in, in church history we have slid a bit away from the high standards of holiness, separation, obedience, and we just kind of uh, over abuse the word grace, 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 grace. For some ways I cannot explain it, but I know that M many of us in this generation have lost some sense of this kind of commitment, of this kind of consecration that God, the Holy God, asks of us or expects of us as, you know, this is wonderful. He says we have confidence to enter. Why do we have confidence to enter? Because I am forgiven. Because I am close to Jesus Christ. I know my life and Jesus is, is, is one. I can draw near to God. I can have full access to God. This is wonderful. But as I enjoy this privilege, I must also think about what's my life like? How, how do I live from Monday to Saturday? Uh, you know, I, do I live in the light? Do I, am I living a life that is honoring uh, the, the, the Lord that I serve? We can come into the presence of God, hear the voice of the Lord, receive His strength and His peace, because he, that is what God wants to do. And when we hear the voice of the Lord, we can speak with authority, because we have heard the voice of the Lord. It is not only our privilege, but it is also our priesthood. It is also our priesthood. Let's talk about our identity and our calling. First Peter chapter 2, verse 5. In Jesus Christ, you yourselves that's what it says does it say that you yourselves are being holy priesthood this is our identity before no we were not in Ephesians we says we were excluded from the covenant we were lost we didn't have a share in the promises of God we, we were strangers and aliens now we are changed into this position. You yourselves are holy priesthood. That is what it is. This is our identity. In verse 9, you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, 
a people of his own possession. What does that mean? A chosen race, the word race is the word genes. Like your genes, you have new genes. Means individually or collectively. It means having come into being born. It's like something happened to you, your genes have been transformed. You, you have now the genes that Jesus Christ is giving to you. It may be the genes of a country or of a generation, collectively or individually. So we have new genes, we are special, we have been chosen, and we have the privilege to come near to God. We are also a holy priesthood and a holy nation, which means ceremonially clean, blameless, innocent, we are okay with God. A uh, people of his own possession, this is, this is good. People of his own possession means a purchased people, a private property belonging to God Almighty, which means that no other people or other thing has any right over me because I'm, I'm special property. Even there is a terminology, it's like a, a hidden treasure, shut up. It's like the, the, the treasure filled with jewels belongs to God and you will open it or close it. This is his property. It's like a special collection of a work of art. It belongs to the master. This is, this is what, what you are. God wants to set us for his will. Now, if we want to explain what a holy and royal priesthood means to you today. This is our identity. Now, what are we to do with that nowadays? If you look in verse 5, it says in verse 5 that you, the context is as living stone in a spiritual house. The context seems to be like church. The context seems to be worship with the collective group together when we are together, when we serve together in the church, when you are a holy, uh, a holy priesthood as you serve in the, in the church. And what are we doing? We are offering spiritual sacrifices to God, praises, and we are doing something that is pleasing to the Lord uh, when we are together in worship uh, in the church. We offer praise and thanksgiving. Verse 9, it says, you are a royal priesthood. And the context here is like a king, a kingdom, and we carry on the will of our king by announcing, by proclaiming a herald, an ambassador. We proclaim the excellencies of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. And the word here, excellencies, means praises or the, the value of his attributes. God is so holy, so good, he's so generous, he's so patient, he's so kind to me, to you. So we, we proclaim that, we make him known, we tell the world and other people around who God is. We declare his, his goodness and what he has done. And other Bible versions says we declare his wonderful deeds, or we declare the excellent qualities of God, or we declare the wonderful things that he has done. That's what. So two things. One seems to be more toward the church and worship. We offer sacrifices, spiritual sacrifices in Christ to God. It's pleasing to Him. It's acceptable. The second thing is turn toward people. We serve people. We, we, you know, like the role of a priest, it stands for God, toward the people, and for the people, toward God. One is a service you make God know to them. You share the will of God to them. You help them come near to God. That's one role. The other one is like you intercede for them. Because some people are so far away from God. It's so hard to bring them to God. They are so, you know, again. So you, you, you pray for them. You do something to, to bring them uh, to God. Remember the, fun the basic function of the priest is to help draw people near to God. So that is what we continue to do today. That's the mission of the church. Go into all the world. What you do, preach the good news. Those who will believe will be saved. Baptize them. 
make them disciples, teach them everything that I have taught you. This is the same thing. The New Testament is saying the same thing as the Old, the Old Testament. So as priests, we help people draw near to God. How do we do that? We live a good example. We live a life. There is holiness here. We live the life of holiness. We have high standards. We, we, we don't take for granted. We don't proclaim that we have faith and we live another kind of life. We set an example with high standards. The other thing that we do, we try to stay as close to God ourselves. If I am the priest and I want other people to come near to God, by me, by my example, by my role, I need first to come near to God myself. I, I must do, excel, strive to do that. So that's what must we do, and we, we pray and everything. So we this is our, our higher uh, calling that we have in the Lord. So this morning we find in this ordination and all the lessons from the Leviticus a lot of lessons for the role that we have been given in the New Testament under our King, under our High Priest Jesus Christ, our Savior. We have been called to be... This, this is really... Uh, when I studied this, this topic, I got something when I realized what a holy priesthood is, what a royal priesthood is, looking at the analogies that we see in the Old Testament in regard to the holiness of God. So where are you this morning when you look at the, your identity and the role that you have in the New Testament? Amen? Amen. Let us stand together. Hallelujah. Father God, we want to thank you this morning reminding us when we revisit